Hello, thank you very much for that introduction. And let me share my screen straight away so that we know um, it's going to work. And I'm very pleased to be asked. Thank you for asking me. Um, with, and I'm sorry not to be there with you in, in Athens and with such a wonderful panel of Richard Reed, Matt Belegere, Ifla, and Stuckton Lezen. Um, and apologies that I'm looking at two screens as we as we talk. We we talked, I talked with Ava about this potentially being up to a 30-minute presentation, but that is long. So Ava, please stand. I will then see you wave at me to tell me to stop. I'll be focusing on programs worldwide, um, but also looking a little at um, Bookstart and Book Trust. So first of all, very briefly about Book Trust. Um, we are the largest reading charity in the UK, founded 100 years ago. Um, most of, and just to make the point that governments can come behind such work in a major way, even a government that has been going through austerity for 10 years and doesn't have a massive reputation in the early years. Um, we are the 10th largest grant from the arm's length of body Arts Council England out of some 1,000 grants, um, so only places like the Royal Opera House and the National Theatre uh, receive more grant than, than we do to support this early years book gifting work. But we also do, and all the pictures around the edge of the screen are the other work that we do that is not early years book gifting, children's laureate, prizes, writers and residents, etc. So to early years book gifting, first of all, just to say, um, Britain does not take the, the, the claim with Bookstart. Uh, it started uh, in the USA. And in fact, Wendy Cooling, who we um, can see here, who, who founded Bookstart at Book Trust, uh, she first saw a program in Pittsburgh, uh, which just started in 1984, a targeted gifting program called Begin With Books, which I think ended in 2010. And then that was followed by Reach Out and Read uh, in Boston, who we're going to hear more from shortly, and now National. Um, and then Books Trust's book start started in about 1991, a, a longitudinal pilot over seven years with 300 children with Birmingham uh, Libraries and Birmingham University, looking at the impact of baby shared reading on educational attainment at the start of school. And those children who had had shared reading as babies were achieving better results when they started school. And this led to the government coming in behind um, the programme with major funding. And why did Wendy Cooling decide that something needed to be done? Because she was seeing in English schools, children starting school without ever having held a book and realizing there were families with no books in the home and she wanted to democratize access to reading and she realized you should start young with babies in the home. The inequality started at the early years and that the home created lifelong behaviors and it had an impact, such work had an impact more than just on educational attainment on society as a whole and we will look at that briefly in a moment. And just to talk about the terms a little bit, why, why book gifting? It's because the books are gifted in person to the babies and their carers by a professional or a trained individual, uh, as you probably all know, who, who explain the gift, the giver guidance leaflet. But more importantly, and this is different programs have more ability to bring this about and to emphasize this, but the gifters model shared reading or reading aloud. And research shows that the more modeling, the more behavior change takes place. And we're talking about new and free books and millions of books. So publishers are a crucial partner. And why do we call it shared reading in the UK? I think because mainly the babies respond. Uh, and I've highlighted Bookstart Japan here with their, um, uh, their videos of babies being presented books and their, and their carers by a trained volunteer at health clinics. 
And the parents are always surprised how much the baby looks at the book, turns the pages, responds, and parents are always saying, we didn't know you could start so young. And reading aloud, which is the wider term, obviously um, has all sorts of connotations to do with the, the important environment of words that the receptive baby mind um, receives, words that are not heard by the baby in normal talk between adults or in baby talk by children, uh, adults to, to children. And it develops their language and their cognitive ability. And on that question of, of issue of the importance of starting young, I've just put the, the images from Raising Literacy in Australia, their gift, their, their leaflet, which they give to, um, to parents, showing those early neuron connections taking place over those very early months. And very briefly, why books and not e-books? And there's a research piece on the benefits of books uh, and the potential dangers of too much digital. I'm going to talk in a minute about um, our book trust's book start program in more detail. But first of all, I just wanted to talk about the importance of diversity and access in such programs. Universal programs, which is what Wendy Cooling's uh, original conception was, and how book start was perhaps different to some of the others, um, meant that it reached everyone without stigma, and that was uh, a great mantra. But also there were families that needed more help. Um, so from quite early on, multilingual books were gifted and are gifted now to families that need them. And there is multilingual guidance in up to 30 languages. And we also gift books, special books for additional needs, what used to be called uh, um, uh, special educational needs. So for visual and for hearing impairment, and also books that we help develop specifically for motor skills, fine motor skills, delay, or various other um, complex multiple additional skills. And again, I've um, put Bookstart Japan here because what they've done wonderfully is develop books for visually impaired parents to be able to read with their children. And with publishers, they have developed some uh, more than 100 uh, books specifically for that need. And we also have targeted programs for, for economically, economically dis disadvantaged families with more, um, more interventions. And book selection is a critical part of this process, and particularly, and, and we have expert panels who, who select our books um, with us, but particularly to ensure diverse representation in books. It's, it's critical that readers and children see themselves and their lives in books. In the UK, a third of school-aged children are from what was called, and it's got a bit out of date, but black and Asian minority ethnic children. And research with University College London showed us that 10 years up to 2017, only 6% of children's books published in the UK were by authors and illustrators of colour, many of those, in fact, from the USA. And our partner, the, the Centre for Literacy Primary Education, showed in as research in 2017 that 4% of UK published children's books were by authors and illustrators of colour, and only one, no, sorry, had characters from Black and Asian minority ethnic groups in their books, and only 1% of those books had that character as the main character. So many of our network members have to ask publishers to adapt books to make them more inclusive. Some have had to commission their own books because their books are not available. These do raise awareness with publishers, which is good. And we have a program, which is at the bottom of the screen there, Book Trust Represents, where we are encouraging new authors and illustrators of colour um, to work in that sector, but also to have profile and to connect them with publishers. And thankfully, some of those statistics are now improving. And very briefly, before we look at this spread across the world, I just want to make the point that COVID has highlighted many things um, to us and the need for such work. 
there's a strong recognition of the need to invest in COVID babies post-pandemic. We were having reports in the UK that um, babies in the poorest families were hardest hit by the COVID lockdowns because they were missing key activities and also to do with, as we will see, to do with parental um, needs. And at one of our meetings, the, the CEO then, Brian Gallagher, of Reach Out and Read, was telling us that COVID showed them that bonding, in fact, was the child-parent bonding, was the most important aspect, maybe, of this programme, even above the, the other educational developments, particularly when you had small children at home needing to feel loved and you had anxious parents. And a, a speaker at the uh, Scottish Book Bug conference during, during the, the height of the pandemic was telling us how babies are hardwired to absorb their parents' emotional states, but that shared reading was the best calming and laughter-making activity that there was, and that how the actual story progression, the narrative, the, the rhyme, the rhythms um, went through a stage of stress leading to calm and the rhythms were even like those of the heartbeat. And this was built into babies' bodies and brains. So let's look briefly uh, at how book start type programs, reach out and read type programs have spread across the world. And I will apologize briefly in advance here because um, reach out and read, you'll see in the second part of the film, do uh, do figure, but not in the first. And uh, a member who's with you today, Nata Pelletre, was not able to, uh, to be involved in, in this, and so they do not figure. But a quick, uh, brief moment of looking at how the programmes have spread around the world. So I hope you were able to hear and see that. Um, and thanks to Japan Bookstart, who created that for us with um, those are all network members in the network that I'll mention briefly now. But just to, to recap very quickly, um, interestingly, after um, the development of, of Bookstart and, and uh, Reach Out to Read, Bookstart had a conference in 2000. Uh, Japan came to that conference uh, with our res the results of our longitudinal study and went back and began a, a program very shortly afterwards in Japan. And that then spread to South Korea, to Taiwan, um, and briefly it was in Thailand and, and Indonesia. And But at the same time, programs have been developing in Canada and Australia and in Italy with Nati Um 
And then it was picked up again through, I think, the Bookstart idea through conferences in, in uh, London or in England, uh, in Europe. So 2005 or so, we get Flanders and then the Netherlands um, and then Germany, Switzerland, Austria, following suit. And then more recently, um, picked up by Sweden in 2014, they came to Book Trust and, and we talked at great length, um, Swedish Arts Council fostering a programme in Sweden. And again, that caused a ripple into Norway. Uh, uh, they're going to be presenting to us at our next meeting in March, their three-year pilot. Um, we've just had a presentation from Finland on their th wonderful three-year pilot uh, and it is spread into the Baltic countries. It's in Lithuania. Um, and moved into Poland and the Czech Republic. And we also know it's elsewhere in the world, in South Africa, uh, in the Caribbean, in South America, in New Zealand, and I'm sure others. And I was just gonna say very quickly why we decided we needed a network to, to talk together um, because there's so much change in society to do, uh, including to do with, with, with digital um, and reading changes and the nature of partnership infrastructures changing on the ground, particularly during periods of austerity. Um, and networking allows us to innovate and to adapt to change. And there were the new digital opportunities. So I set up a, a steering group with members from four continents and we started our full meetings in the early part of 2019. And a year later, the pandemic came and we were all set. Our aim was to share best practice, but also to try and prompt and help programs in other parts of the world. Um, and we have, we filled all our uh, meetings with presentations. So there's a great resource bank there, but we are also now developing toolkits to help in that process. And our meetings cover various um, themes that we think are critical for such work. Um, and we have various key best practice ideas uh, that we set out, such as to do with access and diversity, partnership working, which we'll talk about, which makes all this possible, and the importance of evidence. But first of all, while we're talking about the spread around the world, I just want to talk about two initiatives that are interesting to me at the moment. Um, one is the new initiative from the World Bank, um, their Read at Home program. And you can see World Bank speaker uh, Melissa Kelly talking to the, the network here. So that world map is are there, 20 programs primarily in the Global South, um, fostered by their, their interactions with their local governments who are always behind all these programs. Um, their focus is on advice, their Read at Home manual is to do with um, best practice in, in book gifting, but largely also uh, a lot of work on book procurement, which is such an issue. And interesting to me was they had a lot of focus and had a lot of exposure for a program, not in the Global South, but in North Macedonia, um, which got good exposure and was seen as one of the best examples of a targeted program working well and reaching children effectively and quickly. Uh, and here is their Minister of Social Policy speaking to a World Bank event linked to the Global Education Summit that took place in London uh, last year. And on that point of the Global South, the, the South African organization, Book Dash, is now where we welcome them to the network and then to a working group, their understanding of the Global South um, infrastructure requirements and, and constraints is very valuable to us. And they also have an alternative model of book uh, production uh, because of the difficulties of book procurement in the South, that uh, books at, that are representative and that are reasonable um, cost for, for programs to be able to buy, to give away free. And another initiative that's just happening right as we speak um, in Spain, a bookstart pilot started um, about to start with 200 children in the Basque region of San Sebastian by a small organization called Mestiza, who, who Book Trust has known for many years. But this caught the attention of the Spanish High Commission Against Child Poverty. Um, and they came or presented, in fact, online in the end at the EU Read AGM uh, in this, this summer. 
And the speaker from the High Commission said that they preferred this project over many other activities that they looked at for impacting on child poverty, partly because it was universal and also because it involved the whole family uh, in a way that other programmes didn't. And so they have got behind fostering three other pilots using the same, exactly the same packs and, and university support in each region uh, across Spain. I forget the, the exact regions uh, in Spain, which are all starting now. And if those pilots go well and the, 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 um, the evidence is good, there's the potential for this to lead to a, a national program in Spain, which is um, a wonderful development. So from small things, large things can grow and governments can see the value, not necessarily purely in our normal literacy terms, but in the impact on child um, poverty. And all this works through partnership working. I'm sure you've been talking about this already. Um, and the two key partners are libraries and the health sector. But just on libraries, first of all, uh, they are important to many of our network members, and some of them are some of our network members are library based. Um, so in West Australia, uh, in, in Alberta, Canada, in, in Austria, and some of our some of the programs, the main gifting location. Uh, is or certainly has been the library, such as Bookstart Netherlands. And programs have uh, fostered good family friendly, baby friendly activities in libraries at uh, rhyme times. So, programs like Bookstart Flanders and Bookstart Netherlands have been very strong on that. And all our programs steer participants to libraries for the ongoing support in reading that libraries can give. And very briefly, um, just to talk about Book Trust, we fostered Bookstart, a national Bookstart Week and Bookstart um, rhyme times in libraries across the whole country until quite recently. But they are now so well embedded in the UK libraries, we stepped back from that and we are now running some national pilots to test new ways for libraries to interact with the socioeconomic groups that have not been engaging with libraries. Um, and interestingly, in the UK, and you'll be hearing, I'm sure, more from IFLA um, later, libraries are seen as a, as a unique place, a cultural value venue which the most diverse audience do go to, um, both economic disadvantage and black and Asian minority. And while other users have decreased in libraries, which has partly been behind, I'm, I'm afraid, quite a lot of library closures, in the UK, also to do with local authority funding reductions, massive reductions. Um, but the diverse audience, particularly in the cities, has not reduced in these spaces because they are seen as safe spaces, not elitist in, in the way that most cultural spaces and even bookshops are seen. And the Arts Council England, the main arm's length uh, Department of Culture funding body, sees libraries as the most important interface in the cultural ecology where arts and community can meet and where user-led co-creation can take place and all their funded organisations have to engage with them in some way. But the most innovative um, partnership, which we will be hearing about from Richard and Reed in particular and, and, and uh, Victor and Liz and, and Neta Belegere, it is the health sector. Uh, it enables one to reach uh, babies at uh, massive scale and reach. It uses local community expertise, trusted professionals outside of the book world and therefore widening access. Um, and from our own focus groups, we know that the groups who don't like uh, get engaged with reading say that words that they don't like include things like books and reading. Some of the venues, some of our members, the, the gifting takes place at health centres where the, the, the parents have to bring their children for tests. Um, and this is sometimes by professionals themselves, such as nurses uh, in, Flan in, in, in Finland, or by trained volunteers, uh, as in Bookstart Flanders or Bookstart Japan. In the UK, Book Trust is a uh, baby is gifted through health visitors going to the home. Uh, in Germany and the USA, it's through pediatricians. And in Poland and Nova Scotia, for instance, it is um, through maternity hospitals. And there's good evidence from Nova Scotia that that gifting very early is actually impactful. 
these programs are possible because the, the health sector partners see them as valuable for their agendas. And at one of our meetings, um, again, we chat and we were telling us that the gifting and, and the interaction that, that happens with that is, is a very useful development surveillance tool for them to see motor skills and nonverbal cues. And we might hear more again later, but um, Brian Gallagher was telling us how their research shows it improves clinic morale, doctor satisfaction, the relationship with patients, and parents rate their doctors as more helpful because of such gifting. Health and well-being are crucial things that COVID has highlighted. Um, and the health sector values such work because it, the most important aspects we've mentioned is parent-child bonding, which the, foreground, which the pandemic has foregrounded for us. And well-being is now very important in many policymakers' um, agendas. So, for instance, our arts council and our Department of Culture, their latest 10-year strategy, suddenly well-being is being a way that it never was before. And I, again, coming back to Bookstart Japan here, what is interesting about them coming, taking on the programme in the year 2000, uh, having seen what happened with Bookstart in the UK, they did this not because of a literacy deficit. They did not see that they had a, a literacy issue in Japan, but they did it for societal cohesion, for the baby attachment um, which was the basis of cohesion. And when the, 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 one of their founders spoke to me first about the program, she said, they do this program for peace, uh, which was um, interesting in the, in the Japanese context. But once this was fully explained, I understood where she was coming from. And one of our meetings, the, the, the board member of um, Bookstart Japan, a Japanese pediatrician, Professor Sakakihara, who is a uh, president of the Japan Society of Child Science was telling us all about the, the evidence of societal benefits outside of those just of educational benefits. And our recent research uh, in the UK with parents has been showing that what parents would like to be told to, and that would make them do, do such uh, shared reading and do more of it, is the is the importance of bonding? It is it is activities that will support their bonding with the child that they want um, to find out about more than anything else, which is interesting. And I'm just going to flag up one point very quickly here from from this slide from uh, to do with the evaluation that takes place in in Book Trust across uh, and our research into the into the many benefits is that first of all the graph at the bottom is emphasising again the importance of that starting young, but secondly that in the first six months the quotation there is saying that. Shared reading creates joint attention between baby and caregiver more than any other activity, um, playing with toys, anything else. So this is uh, of great importance. I'm going to skip very quickly over the, the how we, we gifted at Book Trust because I've been seeing um, bags with gifting taking uh, being, being presented already. Um, but just to say the mechanics of it are that each local authority of the 152 in the, in the country um, appoints a Bookstart coordinator who is the main uh, liaison with the health sector and the nursery schools, uh, et cetera, in their region. And they also help with seminars around shared reading and we used to support them in those and perhaps will again. And we're talking of large numbers um, up to from sort of 500,000 to 700,000 giftings uh, to children at up till recently, the three stages, universal gifting at the three stages uh, of baby, age three or four, and start of school, and some four million books a year given out. And just to make the point that there's still lots to do because our family reading survey has shown that even though 70% of parents see reading as important, half of those and across all income groups, they do not see reading books as a big part of family life. And they are ranking 
shared reading as less enjoyable for children than playing with toys or music or gaming or going outside. And so having just seen that it is the best um, bonding mechanism that there is, it is something that we need to, to work on to get parents to then realise that actually it should be, we hope, more enjoyable than other activities. Very briefly, as we draw to an end, just to say that Book Trust is moving a little away from its what was the book start, possibly of universal gifting, which still takes place in baby, but increasingly we are working towards more targeted work with socially uh, and economically disadvantaged families and more interventions uh, across the reading journey in those first five years. And we are piloting a whole range of new programs at the moment. And an ultimate slide really to say that the there's also opportunities for messaging now um, to do with health and well-being to allow us to move beyond the simple this is good for your child's education uh, and one way that we, we did it recently was to talk about the importance of um, of benefits to parents and children through a program called bath book bed and there's very good evidence of shared reading impacting on the calming of children but also on their sleep duration so there are, there are parents might want to be told that this is good for their bonding, but this can be done implicitly in, in certain ways, not necessarily explicitly. So finally, and you've heard a lot about this, but just to make the point that what this sector does is follow the science in a way that is unusual and in fact probably totally unlike most of the creative industries. It's led by the science, it's evidence-led, there are research-based um, programs start with pilots, um, often uh, academic evaluations, sometimes completely independent, uh, with control groups, RCTs, longitudinal studies. We know about the economic benefits because of the impact on educational attainment and therefore jobs and social mobility. But I just want to make a point about the impact on creativity also and the importance that we're seeing increasingly of creativity's impact on economic development. Um, Therefore, early years shared reading is supporting the whole creative economy. The home is the, file, the child's first cultural venue. The parent is the first performer of drama and music. And the book is the child's introduction to visual art. So in my view, early years shared reading is the foundation of the cultural pyramid. And to finish, we know that... Um, crucial lesson is to start young, investing in the early years, as COVID has highlighted, uh, that we need to build back fairer starting with the early years. And economists will tell us, such as James Heckman, that positive parenting is one of the only government measures that has no losers. And the return on investment of early years is massive. So thank you very much. And I will end there.